The No Nonsense Roundtable. It's a weekly show broadcast on Rochester, New York's 50,000 watt iHeart radio station, News Radio Wham 1180. The host, Dom Geneva, interviews guests from all walks of life, all with amazing stories to tell. What you are about to hear is a recording of a previous broadcast without the breaks and commercials. Now, here's host, Dom Geneva. Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of your No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Jennifer, your host, every Saturday here at 10 o'clock on News Radio Wham 1180. And like I like to remind you, you can get all the past shows on NoNonsenseRoundtable.com anytime you want. And today I have somebody on the show who I'm sure you don't know, but I'm sure you should know. And his name is Peter Banks. He's had a long and illustrious career in law enforcement, retired now. Uh, we are recording by telephone. And Peter, well, I, he has a story of his career in the venue of, uh, of child protection and things that you need to know. So, Peter, thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Well, and the question I like to ask people right from the get-go is, uh, what you've done as a career, has this been a straight path or a crooked path? Did, did you want to be in law enforcement since you were a young boy, or was this a uh, pivot that you, that you took? Well, I think my first choice was being a cowboy, <laughs> uh, but the um, uh, it never crossed my mind to, to go into uh, uh, police service. Uh, however, after uh, being asked to leave uh, some, some of the best universities in America, uh, you know, I found myself uh, in the mid '60s um, wanting to avoid the draft. So um, the best way to avoid the draft, the way I figured it, was to enlist. And when you enlist, you get to choose your military occupational specialty, your MOS. So uh, I looked down a, uh, a list of a bunch of things I thought wasn't going to get me killed, mm-hmm. and I saw policeman so i figured hey i can do that uh i enlisted to become an mp i went to uh basic training into mp school and then before the year was out um i found myself on a boat going to vietnam and when i got there uh they asked for volunteers uh for uh to fly as a door gunner for uh, the 498th ambulance medevac unit and i did that and uh got promoted went to the infantry and um when i came back i had about uh, about a year or so left uh in the in the service and uh, during that time uh, they had some recruiters that came down from washington dc it was uh, right after the riots and they were looking to uh, to uh, expand the from 3,500 men to 5,200 uh, officers, and they said, "Hey, how would you like to be uh, the, the police in Washington D.C.?" And I said, I, "I don't know. You know, I think I got a good job waiting for me back home." And they said, "Well, you can get out of the army early." <laughs> oh, there you go. Yep. <laughs> so uh, I signed up to be a police officer. I spent uh, two years in uniform. I absolutely, I loved it. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, my first week uh, on the job, uh, we had two officers killed in my precinct, and that meant on the second week of the on the job, uh, I was by myself in a car because all the veterans and everyone else had. Uh, was uh, going to the funeral um, of these two two fine men, and um, back then, back then you didn't have um, a portable radio. You did the radio was mounted in the car. So right. when you left the car, you left uh, you left all your protection and your backup. And that's where I learned how to talk to people. <laughs> so mm. you don't you don't let your uh, your battleship mouth overload your rowboat butt, as they say. Uh, and I, I loved being in uniform. However, being a detective was the best thing. And uh, I set my sights to become a detective. I did that for a general assignment uh, detective for 13 years. And uh, then I made the mistake of getting one too many questions right on a promotional exam. And I got promoted to sergeant. And I was asked if I would take over the child abuse unit, and uh, that's where uh, that's where it all started. I mean, it was bad enough. I had two kids of my own, um, great kids. I have a son and a daughter, um, and I consider myself a good parent. 
Um, none of them rob 7-Elevens or do drugs. So I did, I was successful <laughs> being a parent. But um, when you see what happens to these children who get uh, physically and sexually abused and how it impacts them, you know, the problems and the worries that I have um, are nothing compared to what these kids go through. And I, and I am sure, I'm positive that there are some of your listeners can relate directly to this because this is a impact, even just sexual abuse that uh, impacts huge numbers of children. And there are some of your listeners are going to be the ones who have not yet um, spoke out, have not yet come to terms with what has happened to them. And I just want to say to, as a reminder to them that it wasn't your fault. It is never your fault and it is never too late. Um, when I, uh, when I got ready to retire from the police department, I was recruited by the uh, national center for missing and exploited children. And I was their director of training and outreach uh, for 20 years. And uh, then I finally decided to, uh, to pack it in. But I had uh, some incredible people that I worked with. I had bosses that were inspirations. We had an issue that there's only one side of. You can't be against uh, protecting kids. So it was uh, it was quite a quite a quite a trip that I've made. And I like to say that I uh, probably have done a lot of things that people dream about doing. And I have probably done things that people only have nightmares about doing. So it's uh, it's been a, it's been a heck of a ride. But uh, um, I loved it. Well, the question that I have about this before we get into any of the particulars is that this has got to be uh, uh, emotionally draining on you. It's like it's like PTSD. It must get like every a dose of this every day that you work in in this type of environment i mean how do you do it well there, there's a couple of things the first thing is you need to put everything in perspective the first thing is that what you feel is nothing to to compare to what these children are going through and how their lives depend upon a, a human being and how that human being will will manipulate this child into either uh, a, a an abusive of a physically abusive situation or or a sexual situation and so it compared to what i go through you know i i have defenses as an adult i could move things i can change things i could i have resources that i i have i have money that i can use to go somewhere else and everything like that but but a child a child has nothing. And, 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 and even I can remember trying to we, – we used to take children into custody when, when it was warranted, when there, when there was uh, fear that the child might, might be continually harmed if we did not. And I can remember trying to – a little kid, he was burnt. Uh, his feet were burnt from hot water. He could he had messed his uh, diaper and um, uh, and you could see br bruises on him in various stages of healing and that meant that it just didn't happen at one time. And, and, and I'm trying to remove this kid and he's clinging to his mother. He's clinging to the person who was, who, who was abusing him and physically assaulting him and everything. And no, 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 I love you, mommy. And, and I mean, it, oh, it, breaks, so you, it breaks your heart. That is so sad. I mean, as a father, I don't know how you could deal with that when you go home at night, other than look at your children and just value that you have that relationship with them that, uh, that encourages them and, and nurtures them. So we're about ready to head into a break, but uh, we're going to be talking more about, well, this and, uh, and other things uh, right after this break. Well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. We're here with Peter Banks, who has spent a, a career in law enforcement, recently retired, and in the venue of uh, being in, uh, responsible for cases of, uh, of, of child abuse. And uh, this is probably going to be the most serious um, 
show that we've had in my 225 or 230 shows. And uh, Peter, thank you for being here. And uh, in the last segment, we were talking about child abuse and what you had to go through as uh, an officer and the things that you've seen and how you kind of had had to deal with that when you got home at night. And you know, let's spend just another se- segment on that. I mean, you must have, um, y- you know, you talk about, you know, PTSD and looking back on things like that. You must have seen some really uh, horrible things, I would imagine. Well, you know, one of the things that we are very mindful of is the effects, especially I had a bunch of detectives working for me. Um, and I was always, you know, I, it always worried me that you see when you are doing an investigation uh, that that your emotion sort of takes control and you have to really be very mindful of that because if you go and do something that's um, let's say contrary to what's accepted, uh, the focus comes on you and it, it comes off of the child and then everybody talks about what you did and uh, how bad you are and nobody nobody uh, cares anymore about the case involving uh, the what happened to that child so it you have to be you have to be very careful I, do you internalize it do you need to talk with people about it you uh, what do you do to to uh, um you know, to kind of refresh yourself, you, you, you look toward the outside to try to get something, uh, you know, like fishing or something that to calm your mind down, mm-hmm. something for you to get lost in, you know, unfortunately, you know, for some uh, that, that includes alcohol. Um, and for some, uh, that includes, can, bringing, um, bringing your work home with you, which is, you know, neither, of which is, is good. So you have to you have to be very careful about that. Uh, um, let me again say that you have there, you may have listeners. I, I don't know if not may you will have there be be listeners um, who have experienced uh, abuse firsthand, who have never told anybody, who have never dealt with it. Uh, we have to be understanding of, of why they do these types of why these they internalize it why they don't tell um but i do want to tell whomever those listeners may be that if you have been abused it is not your fault okay it is never your fault and it is never too late so there is always something some hope and some way that that you can start dealing with it when you're ready. Now, whether you watch the movie or not, uh, the movie that's very popular right now is uh, The Sound of Freedom. And yes. and it, it, it talks about sort of like the industrial child abuse. The kids are, are uh, abducted by people, who, uh, human traffic and, and, and whatever. But that's really not the most common segment of, of child abuse right most of it is 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 homegrown right well, well yeah first of all movies are created for one thing to sell movies okay that's that is the reason and if they're based upon a true story um okay that's where it stops based upon perhaps uh and maybe the true story isn't even true to start with so you always have to remember that. And you are exactly right. Most victimization, especially sexual, sexual victimization of children, is not by some big, ugly monster that lives under the bridge with the long hook nose and the warts. It's not by somebody who goes and kidnaps them and carries them off to a brothel somewhere where they're um, uh, abused for, for years and years. Does that happen? Yes, it does happen. Is there a big, ugly monster? Yes, there is. But those things are so few and far, we, they cloud our thoughts, and we, st- we stop forgetting about what, what can actually happen to the most, for the most part to our kids is they are abused by someone who has gains legitimate access to them and uses that access to victimize them. Now, 
let's let's also remember, first of all, when we talk about people who molest children, who victimize children, who sexually victimize children, um, they, they are um, – you're some 38-year-old fat ball guy who lives with his mother and, and goes on the internet all day uh, isn't the, your, your typical child molester. The typical child molester is uh, someone who over years and years, starting at a young age, uh, victimizes children. And, and when you and I were kids, you know, we were exposed to very limited numbers of things because of the world was different. My friends were the sons and daughters, my parents' friends. My aunt lived across the street. My grandma lived up the block. Everybody knew everybody else. Today, if you have a, uh, a penchant for wanting to victimize a child, you now have instant access to millions and millions of potential victims. Mm. You don't even need to be that good a child molester. You get up to bat so many times, ah. sooner or later, you're going to get a hit. And again, what, what is so devastating is it's generally people who with whom children have put trust or love. You, I had kids, you know, they, they don't know that, that uh, it's wrong. Everybody, you know, little kids like to, to make adults happy, right? Right. I mean, that's, that's just the way little kids are. They don't know that it's wrong to, um, to have to um, sexually stimulate mm -hmm. uh, Grandpa or, or Uncle John or, or Daddy. Um, and when they find out, they're devastated because if they try to tell anybody, the first thing this child molester says, you know, it's your fault. You made me do this. Mm -hmm. You wanted this. You do this. And it might have, as disgusting as it is, it may have made the child happy. And the child may have been given gifts for for doing this types of behavior and and now the the child is totally destroyed and um the, the their their response could be a, a, a number of different ways you know especially when you're talking mm -hmm. about um children say that are are uh, pubescent or or maybe just uh what they call tweens um all of a sudden their grades change significantly all of a sudden their grooming habits change significantly all of a sudden they start acting uh sexually they start acting um you know not taking care of themselves perhaps uh, i mean there's there's all kinds of things that that can happen but but that that is what is makes it so dangerous when it comes to the sexual victimization and the numbers are huge. The, 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 num the, the numbers of females that are, are victimized before they're 18 mm -hmm. is one in five. Oh, my God. And with boys, it's about one in seven to one in ten. They, it's, it's difficult, more difficult with boys um, because of the, it, there continues to be uh, you know, the stigma of mm -hmm. uh, homosexuality. So they're, they're even less inclined to to tell we're, we're about ready to head into a break but this is going to lead into a question i asked uh, our sheriff uh, todd baxter monroe county sheriff for a question to ask you and this leads right into something he suggested for me but we're heading into a hard news break and uh, we'll get back to this right after this well, welcome back. You're listening to the No Nonsense Roundtable. I'm Dom Genova, your host, every Saturday right here on News Radio Wham 1180. And we're talking to uh, Peter Banks, who has a, a long and uh, storied career in uh, law enforcement with a, uh, a concentration on uh, catching very bad people who abuse children. And we were talking during the break uh, about the abuse that you see in this movie is different. Uh, the Sound of Freedom is different than really the major part of child abuse and uh, the major part of child abuse is, is domestic uh, is domestic uh, child abuse and and I have a question here and the question is from Todd Baxter who's uh, our Monroe County Sheriff and um, 
He says, I think most parents want to know what are the indicators or commonalities leading up to abuse. And then he, he's talking about, ask you about the initiation stages, the manipulation, uh, secret keeping, uh, grooming, whatever. And so uh, give us some, some insight to, to, to this stuff, if you would, Peter. Well, certainly, you know, children as they're growing up are naturally, first of all, they're naturally curious. Um, and and secondly, they are naturally vulnerable because they haven't had the experience that that, that used to protect them. That's why a parent's role is is so important for that. And you you really need to be involved in your child's life um, and understand what what their pressures that they're on. You know, I was just recently reading a report. Um, and it was from some time ago, it was about uh, 10 years ago where, um, children were going to school in a middle school here in, uh, in Virginia. And, um, uh, instead of going into class, uh, some of the children were taken to a nearby house and, um, uh, forced to perform sexual acts and, uh, um, and, and the like, and then being brought back to school just before school let out so that, uh, nobody knew. And this was, uh, some gang activity that was going on, um, in the school. And now everyone is saying that the school knew about it and, and they ignored it. And, well, it's been 10 or 12 years since this happened and it, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a hard road to hoe, but, um, when we see our children starting to act differently and starting to act um, and and starting to change, um, you know, it's, it's hard now. I mean, I remember when my daughter turned 13 and was possessed by the devil. Uh, <laughs> I, we were sitting watching TV and, and she got ready to go upstairs and go to bed. And I said, hey, Mayor, how about a kiss? Good night. And she, she looks at me and says, Dad, I kissed you last week. <laughs> That's and, right. and I could just see the police and be saying, hey, you get over here right now. Yeah. You give me a kiss. You know? yeah. Then I could see her going to school the next day and telling telling her friends, you know, my daddy makes me kiss him. You know? And then I oh, could see geez. a social worker come to my house. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I just figured, well, you know, maybe I should read up. And they said, uh Hey, uh, you know, you just have to gut it out when they're thirteen. Uh, she'll come back when she gets her license. So <laughs> what, what? So so what should a parent um, or, or anybody involved with a child's life be? Uh, what What are some of the indicators? What are some of the things that that people see but they don't see? Uh, changes in the child's behavior, uh, in their grooming habits. In their um, maybe isolation or in uh, unexplained um, knowledge of sexuality, ah, um, especially you know with with the younger children, or acting in in um, sexually provocative ways, uh, when it, you see children that are. You know, I mean, everything, when when we're talking about this, I I keep thinking about stuff that happens in my mind uh, that had happened uh, in different cases. Uh, And I remember I'd go into children's hospital and um, there was a little girl in there who had uh, uh, two different types of sexually transmitted diseases. Oh, jeez. And... um, uh, I went in and we, I was with the doctor and we talked to the little girl and uh, she told us that her mother's boyfriend was uh, messing with her. That's what she said, messing with her. Uh-huh. And um, I went out to talk to the mother and I, and I confronted her. And the mother looked at me and said, he says, well, I told him to stop, but you know how men are. And I looked at her like, you you know what? If I was a mother, what I would do to this guy? I mean, it was like just you, you, you got to understand. But 
I mean, she didn't have, um, uh, she didn't have, and, 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 and this is something that's very important for, for parents to, to be able to protect your kids, is that you need to arm, as a parent, you need to arm your children with the absolute number one weapon that they can use to protect themselves. And that is self-esteem. And when you get up in the morning, you tell your kids that you love them, that they make you happy, that they make you proud. Because if you don't tell them, somebody else will. Now, don't don't under, misunderstand. It is not our children's responsibility to 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 uh, protect themselves. It's our responsibility to make sure our children are in safe environments. Well, Peter, this 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 compels another question because we have a, a fellow here in Rochester. He owns, uh, actually owns Bob Johnson's dealer group, and uh, his name is John Love, and he wrote a book. I sent you the book. The book is uh, yes. you, you Failed yes. Me, about his experience as a young boy uh, being abused. It wasn't sexually abused. It was, it was, uh, he, was he was beaten, and, and actually he was homeless for a while. The family wasn't homeless. He was homeless. And he yes. had to he had to extract himself from that uh, from yeah. that situation. It's a great book. Uh, you failed me, but uh, I asked him for a question to give you, and he goes, uh, "In your opinion, why is it that so?" And this is his words, "In your opinion, why is it so many women seemingly pick the bad guys or bring someone into their child's life who, on the surface, will do nothing to improve their child's lives?" That's a yeah. that's a really that's a difficult question. Yeah. You know, again, I, I'm getting a flashback. You know, I go and and, um, and and you get a call for a domestic violence and you go there and, and, and there's a woman there and she's beat up and some guy had beaten her up and you lock him up and you take him away. And six months later, you're back at the same place and there's the same woman and a different guy has beaten her up. It's like like she kind of attracted them, mm-hmm. and this is what what see what's normal for you and I is not normal for for everyone, and some people have grown up in 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 situations, and I'm not offering it as an excuse, but merely as an explanation uh, that they attract the types of individuals that are going to. Uh, have their will over them and that to, and to control them because this is what they're used to um this is what this uh the victims are uh, are have, have are considered they consider normal um we don't you know we look at situation we we, we go into a into a home and you see a child that has been um uh, has been physically abused and you try and, and, and it was our obligation that if we thought that the child was in immediate danger, that we remove the child from the home and place the child in, in care. And, um, and yet you, the, the child doesn't want to leave the child. Right. What happened? We, I had a little girl, um, we had gotten a call from a neighbor and the neighbor had said, about hearing all this noise and screaming and everything, and it goes on a lot and everything. And we go to this house, and there's a little girl, a little girl, eight years old, and uh, she's in a nightgown. And, um, uh, you know, I asked her a couple of questions to try and find out if there was something going on. And, you know, she was saying, oh, everything was fine and everything like that. Uh, and then... I said, okay, well, you know, we just want to check you out a little bit here and, and took her nightgown off and she had, had bruises all over her back and her, and her butt, uh, that were in various stages of healing. So they weren't just administered one time. Uh, it was in, you know, of of different times and, um, make a long story short. She had, uh, forgotten to turn in a paper. She got in trouble at school for not turning it in. She got brought it home to her grandma, who was her guardian. And uh, so grandma used the um, electrical cord to uh, administer corporal punishment. Well, 
the girl was with her paternal grandmother because originally her mother had physically abused her. So her and her mother was incarcerated for for drugs and, she, and the little girl was put with her maternal grandmother and her maternal grandmother physically abused her. And so she was removed from custody from the maternal grandmother and put in paternal grandmother's custody. And she knew that if she told me that grandma had beat her, that I was going to take her away and put her in a home. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and she would rather uh, endure the pain mm -hmm. and have the safety. Right. I hate to interrupt you, but we have to go into a break, but we're going to pick up on this when we, when we come back. Well, welcome back. We're talking to Peter Banks, who's had a long career in uh, in law enforcement. And also, Peter, Peter, you were involved with the National Center for uh, Missing and Exploited Children in, uh, in John Walsh's uh, deal there, right? Yeah, I was the uh, director of training and outreach for uh, 20 years. Absolutely. I had two guys that I worked that were just, I mean, it was a, a unbelievable experience. Uh, very supportive heroes that... Uh, uh, that ran the place and and we we uh, we really did some some fine fine work um, we got we have a branch up in Rochester mm -hmm. that's uh, run by uh, Ed Suck and um, and uh, the uh, uh, on Lake Avenue and it's it's yeah. uh, we had the training center up there mm -hmm. also uh, that had been sponsored by one well, the Polisani Polisani family. Mm. And, now, uh, um, one of the things that we were you were talking about in the last segment is the uh, the reluctance of, of a child to tell an, uh, somebody in authority that something is amiss, which John Love talks about in his book. He says uh, an administrator or somebody would say something to him in front of his mother, and he expects <laughs> he expects him to say something about his mother in front of his mother, and, and that's not going to happen. I mean, the, yeah. the the child is is just programmed that way. And, you know, so that's, that's absolutely reinforcing what you say. But, you know, the other thing that John said, because I asked him to give me a question for your comment, and he said that uh, I should tell you, and uh, because he had a police officer in his life that, that he looked up to and uh, kind of uh, the police officer really kind of mentored him as a, as a young boy. And uh, he said... Um, he said, tell Peter, you should know that he, in caps, made a difference in a child's life. It meant, he says, it may not be obvious, but it certainly happened. And, and, and you have to have a, a feeling of that, that you've affected a lot of kids' lives. But he, he says, sort of like, you, you need to get the, the approval and recognition of people that you may not have ever known appreciate what you did, but do appreciate what you did. Well, you know, especially, uh, you know, among other professionals, uh, we, uh, the, per the first person I'm thinking about uh, when, when you just m talk about how you make a difference in kids' lives, there's a guy down in Dallas, Texas, by the name of Bill Walsh, that uh, um, he, he's, he has been on the forefront of, uh, of the child abuse scene for uh, 40 years. And he had 35 years ago, he started having a little conference to get some of the training for, for his men, uh, the men and women who work for him. Um, they have had a conference every year for the last 35 years. And right now the attendance is like a, in the five thousands and they get the best of the best of 200 to 250, um, uh, speakers and, uh, uh, professionals to, to come and, and train and teach about, uh, how we can better serve the kids and how we can make, make a difference in a, in a child's life. And, uh, you know, if you, if you're able to hit 5,000 professionals, uh, you're certainly going to make a difference in, in tens of thousands of children's lives. And just like what you're doing here, uh, there is the, the thousands of people that listen to you are going to remember something about this show and they're going to use it and implement that for, for, uh, better protecting their kids and, and the kids that they come across. Well, that compels a very interesting question, actually. I mean, what can people do? What, what can this average listener do? 
Well, you know, th- there is a um, <laughs> when it comes to raising children, uh, it seems that some folks feel that whatever it is that they do, this, this is my child and I can do whatever I want to um, uh, to raise this child in, in the way that I want to, which is pretty much okay, but it's not totally okay. There are certain norms and certain things that uh, are acceptable in in a civilized society that uh, uh, that we have to have to live by. And as a uh, you know, just as a citizen or as a relative or a neighbor or a mentor or a teacher, um, that when you observe something uh, about the behavior of a child and and something that is uh, conflicting to the interests of the child, you need to tell somebody. Uh, well, you, you know, which which leads me to that direction. You know, when when you're when you're traveling or you're in the some place uh, where you see a sign and says, "If you see something, say something." Yes, uh, and I yeah. and I think people are reluctant to say anything. I mean, don't you don't you think so? Sure, sure, especially when it comes to somebody else's to, children. Yeah. Um, you know, is it, but you have to draw a line someplace. <laughs> it's like, uh, it is not okay to, it is to, to hurt a child. If, if you, um, cross that line or you want to get the child's attention, you want, you want to discipline a child in certain ways, uh, is corporal punishment, uh, acceptable to a point. What point is that? When you lose control, ah, in disciplining your child, you are wrong. Mm-hmm. When you lose control, when you're disciplining your child. Now, I mean, come on, we've all done this. You'll never watch television for again for the rest <laughs> of your life. You got, you'll be going to bed at six thirty, and right. uh, you, yeah. you and you're going to get peanut butter for, for yeah. breakfast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the next day, uh, yeah, you know, like, yeah. everything is, yeah, you just step back. Why? Because, see, kids are the only thing in America that you don't need a license to have a kid. Right. Anybody can have kids. Right. Uh, even stupid people can have kids. And then sometimes they have a lot of kids. And they put themselves in situations which are stressful. Now, you, 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 first of all, you don't know what you're doing because you've never been a parent before. You don't know what to expect. All you see is what you've seen on, on, on TV. Um, and maybe as you were raised as a child and you grew up okay, so I guess it's okay for me to do the same thing to my child. Yeah. So Peter, we, we're we're heading toward the the end of the uh, the show. Unfortunately, I, I I would love to have you on again to talk more about this because it's so it's so important and and uh, there's so much else to talk about. But you know, over the years in your your career, and you've done this for you know what thirty years before you retired, thirty five yeah. years. How many how many years has it been? Forty three. Forty three years. God bless you. So yeah. yeah. So t- tell me the one thing before before we close out the show that you want our listeners to take back, even if you're repeating something. T- t- take, if there's anything you can take back from the show and child abuse and what we need to do, look for whatever. What what would that what would that be? Well, number one is don't be frustrated when you're dealing with the system. <laughs> That's, that is the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is, is that you understand, you listen to your children. Do, do children lie? Do so? Yes, children lie. And you know what? They lie. How much? They lie about the same as adults lie. And they lie for the same reasons, to stay out of trouble. So you listen to children, and when they talk, when they tell you things, you have to understand what they're saying as opposed to the exact words. When they tell you they don't want to go to grandpa's, when they tell you they don't want to go to school or the cup or the scouts, uh, try to figure out why. why? That is. Mm-hmm. And, and 
it's it's difficult. The kids don't to ask a why question to a child is is uh, is very difficult, uh, and you got to start adding things up. And it's it it is remember that that a child is uh, wants to be safe and wants to be happy, and uh, sometimes they get confused as to how that can happen to them and how how that should yeah. be. Uh, and they don't know. They don't have the sophistication that they understand all about different relationships. So they could be getting victimized and never and never tell anyone. And the fir- what's the first thing we say? Why didn't you tell anybody? Well, of course, why didn't I tell anybody that daddy was messing with me? Because I knew what's going to happen is that as soon as I tell, they're going to yank me out of the house. Mm-hmm. Daddy's going to go to jail. He's not going to have a job anymore. The family's going to be destroyed. And we think, why should I tell anybody? Right. So, Peter, uh, 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 unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time. Uh, and uh, I, I absolutely am going to invite you back to get more in-depth to this uh this topic because it is so important and uh i i'm just gonna have to thank you for for coming in now and uh, remind everybody that the no nonsense roundtable is uh every saturday at 10 o'clock and we'll see you next week thanks for listening tune in every weekend from 10 to 11 on news radio wham 1180 don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll make more